Welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have nine stories. This was my first time recording in three months, so hopefully they sound good. I think they sound fine, but I had a hard time finding my old settings. I've had a great vacation. I'm also very happy to be back, but I won't waste your guys' time. If you have a story you'd like to submit, stories can be submitted to reddit.com slash r slash slumber reads. Likes and comments are always appreciated if you enjoy. Subscribing if you're new is as well. Enjoy the video. And as always, I hope you all have a great night. I'm not a fan of shopping malls. Why shop in real life when online stores exist? It baffled me that people preferred shopping in public when they could sit in the comfort of their own home with a frothy latte, the newest styles just a tap away. My parents are not exactly technologically advanced. Sure, they own a phone and an iPad, which they're practically glued to all day. But mom is convinced that if she uses her credit card online, some anonymous scammer will empty her bank account. Those things do happen, I'm not saying they don't. But mom won't even online shop on big brand clothing sites, ones that have a very clear we are not a scam banner at the top of the page. Over the last year, she's been kind of forced to use online stores, but mom still hates it. She still asks me 100 times if the transaction is safe and then goes into panic mode when the page freezes. It doesn't freeze because of some faceless entity stealing all her savings. It freezes because she taps buy now repeatedly. The only site mom trusts is Amazon, and it took her a year to fully get used to buying things. Well, I guess she was forced to get used to it. When we went into lockdown, mom had to swallow her stubbornness. Unlike my mother, I don't go to the mall unless I absolutely have to. Or my friend drags me there on a day out. I preferred the park. Or maybe the local swimming pool, but Nina wasn't the type to argue with. When she rang me a few days ago, excitedly gushing about a shopping trip she had been planning all morning, I felt like I had to say yes. I graduated back in May, and I'm taking a gap year before college next year. Nina was doing the same, but job searching wasn't on her mind. Shopping was. She was talking so fast, so convoluted, I could barely understand her. But I got the gist of it. It was sale season, and Nina was eager to be first in line. Now, I'm not sure if I've made it clear, but I hate going out in public. I've suffered from anxiety since I was a kid and untreated. It bled into my teenagehood. I take meds for it, and I'm not as bad as I used to be. But I still hate enclosed spaces, such as our local mall. I'm fine going to school or a job, but... Being in a crowd is just a no-no. Greensley is a small town, and I like that. Nina wants to move to New York or LA, but city's life terrifies me. I can't even go to the mall without freaking out. I can't even imagine what moving to a big city like New York would do to me. Anyway, I didn't exactly have a choice that day. Mom and Dad were at work, and I used the excuse that I was job searching with Nina. It started out fun. We got takeout noodles from a fancy Japanese restaurant that Nina insisted on paying for, and scoured Barnes & Noble. The problem started when Nina started in the clothes stores. I say stores, but she spent pretty much all afternoon in Forever 21. Sure, I like looking at clothes, but Nina takes ages. Last summer, during a heat wave, she took nearly three hours in one store. I was hoping history wasn't going to repeat itself. After all, I had told her multiple times I didn't want to spend forever in the clothing stores. And Nina had laughed, insisted that she wouldn't even be half an hour. When an hour passed, and she was still staring at the same dress and bag combo, I realized I'd made a mistake. 
two hours passed, then three. I'm not sure what I ended up doing. Forever 21 was right in the middle of the mall, just next to the food court. I knew the exits by heart, but once my stomach started twisting with nausea, that oh-so-familiar prick of panic creeping up my spine, my palms grew sweaty. I tried to follow Nina, tried to give her compliments, but after several pathetic ones riddled with the same adjectives, I ended up walking around aimlessly. I tried to distract myself with my phone, but the smell of food was making me feel sick. There was a record store opposite, and I spent maybe two minutes in there. But the music was too loud. The crowd outside was growing, and I felt like I was suffocating behind my mask. I had to get out. That's all I could think. I had to get out. I had to suck actual air into my lungs, or I was going to die. That was my mind talking. I know it was. I know it was stupid, but once the thought was rooted, I couldn't suppress it. Felt like I was drowning and I could no longer remember the exits. I could taste the noodles from lunch in the back of my throat. I was going to throw up. My mind kept telling me. I was going to throw up and everyone was looking at me. I find it hard to tell people that I'm sick so I end up not telling them. I keep it to myself and pray that I start to feel better. Except at that point, I was shaking. I could barely breathe and I keep swallowing bile coating the back of my throat. When I found Nina standing in front of a mirror, holding a dress to her slim figure, I had to choke back a sob. Hey. I tried to smile. I tried to act like I was fine. Nina, we've been in here for ages. He's cute. Nina cut me off, twirling around, her blonde hair a halo in her face. I've always envied her looks compared to mine. While Nina looks like a model, I'm kind of bland. In her hands were a combination of the exact same skirt, and I struggled to figure out what she was talking about when my gaze followed hers. Nina was talking about a mannequin a few meters away. Forever 21 had a guys and girls section with the girls' section being downstairs and the guys at the bottom of an escalator. Though, in the girls' section, for the summer-slash-fall collection, there were a myriad of mannequins, both male and female. The one Nina was staring at was an adult male mannequin. It wore a tight black shirt, skinny jeans, and sunglasses. Like my friend, once I'd caught sight of it, I couldn't look away. Nina must have been thinking the same thing as me because she turned to me, a grin plastered on her lips. Men. She marched over to the mannequin and ran her manicure down the material of his t-shirt. That is the hottest fucking mannequin I've seen in years. She gushed. Are we like, totally sure he's not real? I was fairly sure of it. Not he wasn't real. The thing was plastic, for God's sake, though I couldn't help agreeing with her, at least at the back of my head. The mannequin didn't look human. That wasn't it. But it didn't look like a mannequin either, if that makes sense. Nina's eyes were wide. She cocked her head to the side, her lips curling into a frown. I know this sounds crazy, but does he look familiar to you? I expected her to be joking around, but her expression was deadly serious. Like, I feel like I've seen him before. That's crazy, right? I folded my arms, giving the mannequin a once-over. She was right. I didn't recognize the face because there wasn't really one. At least, not at a first glance. When I looked closer, however, there were facial features I couldn't ignore. Looking past the plastic sheen, the perfect jawline. I realized I was seeing exactly the same. But I would never say that. Nina needed glasses, but insisted on wearing contacts on a prescription that barely helped her. I'd lost count of how many times I'd had to yank her out of the way of a car. Him? Nina, it's a plastic doll. But Min, how can you not see it? She snorted out a laugh. He's got actual eyebrows. Her eyes snapped to his lower torso and kept going. I knew where she was looking, and I felt my cheeks grow warm. Nina, are you done? 
Her gaze snapped to me. Why that much detail, though? Her lips curved into a smirk, and she squealed, nearly bumping into a passing woman who shot her an odd look. It is so we can show off to the girl mannequins. I was slowly losing my patience. We're probably making them more human-like to market the clothes better. Nina scrunched up her face before sighing with a nod. She took a step back. I didn't move. Maybe it was the sick feeling that was growing worse in my gut, but my feet were glued to the floor. I wanted to look at the mannequin properly when a bustling crowd of teenagers weren't around me. Part of me expected Nina to marvel at more, but she shook her head with a grin. You're right. He's plastic, but it's kind of hot, right? She waggled her eyebrows at me. Is it weird that I'm crushing on actual plastic? I ignored the comment and forced myself to follow her to the changing rooms, where she spent nearly an hour picking out the best outfits. When Nina was done, the store was emptying. The sales assistant crept up behind us. She looked tired, though, was somehow maintaining a Cheshire cat grin. I wondered how many girls like Nina showed up on a daily basis. We close in five minutes. You two should head to the checkout counter. Nina bought four t-shirts and three dresses. When she was swiping her card, my dancing stomach decided it really needed to go to the bathroom. I was half aware of a bathroom by the changing rooms. Hey, I'm gonna head to the bathroom. I said, my cheeks blazing. Don't wait for me, okay? I'll walk home. Just the idea of sitting in Nina's car without air conditioning for 45 minute drive made me want to curl into the ground and die. Nina looked baffled, but she nodded. Are you okay? Her eyes narrowed. Min, you look kind of pale. I'm fine. I choked out, backing away. It's my... it's my time of the month. Oh, okay. Nina's expression brightened. Do you need a pad? I shook my head. No, it's fine. She nodded, swinging her bags around. The motion made me feel worse. Hey, do me a favor. My phone died, but I really want a pic of Daniel. Can you get one when you come out? Daniel? She giggled. Behind the counter, the sales assistant laughed along. The mannequin. You know, the hot one. Ah, uh, yeah. The sales assistant nodded while folding up Nina's clothes. Our mannequins get a lot of attention, particularly the male ones. Though we have had several boys taking selfies with the girl mannequins. It's adorable. Nina, with her usual charm, grinned. The one by the door is gorgeous. How do you make them so lifelike? No idea. The sales assistant shrugged. They've been here for a while. I only started last year. Hey, men. Nina was in Nina land. Though I wasn't surprised. Do you think if we grab him and run, we'll get caught? I didn't reply, dashing to the bathroom. I don't know how long I spent in there. I could hear voices from outside, staff shouting their goodbyes between colleagues. The noodles from the Japanese place didn't exactly agree with my stomach. I scrolled through my Instagram, searching for anything to distract me. Nina had already made a post with an unflattering snap of the two of us in front of a mirror. I liked and commented. I thought it was food poisoning, but I didn't throw up. I had the stomach pains and nausea, but I didn't actually barf. When the pop music stopped playing over the speaker, and the lights flickered off outside, I panicked. The words, wait, were stuck in the back of my throat, but I swallowed them down. The bathroom, thankfully, was well lit. I did a quick once over in the mirror. My cheeks were pale, and I looked horrific, but at least Nina was gone. When I hesitantly slipped through the gap in the door, I stepped out straight into the pitch-dark hallway leading back into the store. The lights were still on, though there was no sign of anyone. The checkout counters were empty. The shutters were yet to be pulled down, so I hurried for the exit. Instead of leaving the store, though, I found myself gravitating towards the hot mannequin once again playing with my phone in my hands. Nina wanted a photo, and sure I could tell her I didn't have time, but part of me wanted to snap a picture of it too. 
Something about it. The way it was perched on its stand, human-like features carved into glistening white plastic, gave me the creeps. Still, though, I took a few steps back and held up again, this time with flash on. I removed the ray band so I could get as much detail as possible. But once I was seeing eyes that were far too intricate, I snapped more photos to get it over with. The mannequin's eyes were freaking me out. If I suspended my disbelief for a moment, I found myself wondering how long the design had taken. Someone must have spent hours carving the iris and each individual lash. I wasn't really paying attention to the mannequin. My attention on the photo. I was staring at it and the twisting feeling in my gut worsened. But it wasn't because of food poisoning. I could have sworn the mannequin had blinked. Peering at the photo, it didn't look like a full blink. More like its eyes were flickering. Moving. Ow! The voice. The male voice, which sliced into the silence. A voice that shouldn't have been there sent me stumbling backwards. My phone flying out of my hands and hitting the floor with an audible crack. In front of me, the mannequin's eyes had blinked open and were half-lidden, staring at me in confusion. No, I wasn't crazy. I was seeing emotion. Actual emotion in its face. When it brought up its hands to stare down at them, and then claw at its face, I realized it had fingernails. It moved like a human being, not like a plastic doll. The mannequin's gaze was stuck to its own hands, and then its eyes, its human eyes the color of warm chestnut, were settling on me. The longer I looked at it, or I guess, him, I understood what Nina said was right. The mannequin did look human. It looked too human to be plastic, to be a doll, and yet, when I drunk him in fully, trapped in my own state of paralysis, he was starting to look less plastic, like it was dripping away, revealing light, tanned skin. Fuck. The mannequin blinked, his voice a soft croak. When he blinked again, this time rapidly I glimpsed veins of dark red bleeding to life. My heart catapulted. There was no way, I thought dizzily. There was no fucking way that much detail had been put in. There was no way I wasn't looking at a person. How... How long has it been? His words were hitting the sound barrier, but I wasn't registering them. All I could think was that I had to get out. Whatever was happening, I wanted no part in it. I was hallucinating, I thought hysterically, taking slow steps back. One step, two, but I couldn't turn around. Not yet. I couldn't stop staring at the mannequin which was looking less and less like a mannequin by the second. I wasn't looking at a plastic doll. I was looking at a boy. No. A man. Maybe 19 or 20. His expression. I could only see pain. I could only see fear. And it didn't make sense on a mannequin's face. Because I was supposed to be looking at one, right? I'd been around him all afternoon following Nina around. I'd passed it multiple times and not once did I wonder if there was a living, breathing human under there. What I was seeing defied logic and science and reality. It shouldn't have been real. It shouldn't have been staring at me right in the face. So I did what any other person would do. I ducked down, grabbed my phone, and ran. At least, I tried to run. I had only taken three shaky steps before a sharp yelp filled the air. When I twisted around, the mannequin had crumpled to the floor. When he lifted his head to look at me, I caught tears glistening on perfect cheeks. He was crying. Please. He croaked, struggling to get up, but his body was failing him. Every time he tried, he dropped back down with a startled cry. I found my gaze gravitating towards his cheeks, and I swore something was chipping from his cheek. Falling away, tiny white flakes dancing in the air, everything inside me, every instinct I had was telling me to leave him, to run for it, but the boy was hysterical. He reminded me of a child who couldn't walk yet. 
When he failed to get up once again, he held out a trembling arm. Please, you have to help me. I don't... I don't know where I am. I keep waking up and I don't know where I am. I see... I see faces staring at me and I can't move. I can't... I can't fucking breathe. When he broke down, I found myself wrapping my hand around his arm hesitantly. I nearly let go, shivers spiking up and down my spine. I didn't touch plastic. I touched skin. I touched skin that had been hardened to look like plastic. I couldn't help myself. The words slipping out, You're a mannequin. I hissed out sharply. I couldn't stop myself from running my fingers up and down his arms, touching real skin. When I risked tracing his lips and nose and eyes, they were real. His hair, which had been slicked back, seemed to come to life. Dark curls bouncing back into place didn't make sense to me. Nothing made sense to me. He was a mannequin, and he wasn't. He was an inanimate doll, and he wasn't. The boy hissed out, waving me away. Can you stop? His eyes were wide, lips curled almost like an animal. Do I look like a fucking mannequin to you? But... The camera flash. He muttered more to himself than me. The camera flash brings us back. Before I could speak, he sent me a panicked look. His eyes growing frenzied. Dad? Is Dad here? Dad? I repeated in a whimper. He nodded. I don't remember much, except Dad. All I remember is drowning. I remember screaming into freezing cold water. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't shout or cry. I was going to... I was going to die. And I felt arms around me. It was Dad. He pulled me out and helped me breathe again. He gave me my breath back. There was a light smile on the boy's lips, as if he was reminiscing before his expression darkened. And he wouldn't let us go. He wouldn't let me see my mom, and when I tried to get out, he... he did something to me. He took away my thoughts and my breath, and I was... I was lost. I was lost for so long, and then this boy... He trailed off, his voice breaking. This kind boy. One day he brought me back. I don't know how, but I could breathe again. He told me he was going to get us out. All of us. He told me he was going to take us home and I was going to see my mom again. And then dad took him away and I fell asleep again. Fell asleep until now. My mouth was filled with questions, but I choked them back when he forced himself up, holding out his arms to steady himself. When I offered help, he shook his head. I watched him stumble over to another of the mannequins, a pretty female one brandishing a light pink summer dress and Ray-Bans. I didn't want to properly look at her, because I knew when I did, I'd get the same feeling. I wasn't looking at a mannequin. I was looking at a person. I didn't want to think that, that the mannequin was just like the boy, trapped behind a spell I still couldn't understand. Skin and blood and bodily organs armored under plastic. I thought about the way Nina had laughed and the mannequin hours earlier. Shouting that the mannequin's body sent unrealistic expectations for women. Except it was a real body. Jessa. The boy whined. He stood on his tiptoes, wrapping his arms around her and trying to heave her off her stand. He twisted around to face me. Don't just stand there. I need to get her down. A camera flash brings us back. So do the same to her. He was yelling. And I didn't have the heart to tell him my phone was dead. I'd max it out completely with the photos of him for Nina. I couldn't move. Watching the boy try to heave the female mannequin off of the stand. I wondered if I was losing my fucking mind. When he couldn't lift her. He dragged his feet over to a second male mannequin. 
one with a leather jacket and designer shirt underneath. Noah, he said in a breath. Fuck, I'll get you and Jessa out if you're okay. Just hold on a bit longer. We're, we're getting the fuck out of here. Without turning to me, his hand still grasping Noah's arm, the boy choked out a sob. What you did to me, he said shakily. Can't you do it again? My phone's dead, I said softly. But, but don't worry, I'm going to help you. The boy broke down, his knees hitting the floor. I felt the emotion writhing through him. I need to get out. He was whispering, tearing at his hair. I need to get out. I need to get out. Please, please help me get out. I just want to go home. I want my mom. I don't want to be here anymore. Somehow, I coerced words in my mouth. You're not going to be, I said. I'm getting you out. He looked skeptical, his gaze going to his lap. All of us? You promise? I nodded. What's your name? The boy lifted his head to look at me and I caught desperation in his eyes. My name is... Ben. A male grunt sounded, and the boy stiffened. Young man, where are you? You know your father doesn't like it when you leave your stand. Shit. Ben grabbed me, struggling to pull me to my feet. His face was inches from mine, a hot breath feathering my cheeks. If I'd had any doubts he wasn't human, that moment crushed them. The police, he said, grasping my hands and squeezing hard. Go to the cops and bring them here. I don't think I can run, and I'll only slow you down. Listen to me. You have to get them to listen. Even if you sound crazy, get them to come here. I wanted to argue with him. I wanted to tell him that there was no fucking way the cops would believe me. And I didn't want to leave him. I didn't want to leave him to a fate worse than death if I failed. Ben Maddox. Ben whispered. His fingers entangled with mine. Hot and sticky with sweat. And I reveled in the feeling of real human flesh. He was real. Ben was real and I was going to get him out. I was going to end his nightmare. My name is Ben Maddox. He gestured to the accent. The shutters were halfway down. Go. Footsteps. I had to slap a hand over my mouth. Oh, Ben. The man's voice was soft. You know I don't like it when you disobey me. Before I could speak, he jumped up on shaky legs and raised his arms. All right, Dad. You got me, he said loudly. And I took that as my cue to make a run for it. I didn't think. I just ran. I ran until I was at the mall's exit, stepping out into fresh, cool air. It was night. The sky pitch black. The police station wasn't far, and I found myself sitting in a box-like room in front of a cop who looks around my dad's age with grayish hair and stains down his shirt. I had been hysterical and out of breath when I'd ran into the station. They provided me with a glass of milk that I kept sipping until my stomach complained. I could barely believe anything that had happened. There were still holes I couldn't understand. Like how Ben and Jessa hadn't aged, and how their skin could look and feel so much like plastic. With doubts still haunting the back of my mind, I still told the officers everything ignoring their raised eyebrows and twitching lips. Let me get this straight. He eyed me like I was crazy. I felt crazy. The cop had a notepad, but when I glanced at it, he'd only written Forever 21 and Mannequins. You're telling me the mannequins in Forever 21 are actual people? I nodded, gulping down the rest of my milk. I know I sound crazy. Ben told me that. But if you just go there and see yourself... Ben? The cop raised an eyebrow. The door slid open, and a female officer strode in. I nodded. Ben Maddox. I said sharply. And 
and Jessa, I think her name was. Ben Maddox? The officers exchanged glances before the man fixed me with a steely glare. He sat back, picking up his notebook and flicking through it. Young lady, have you heard of the Moorhead incident? Something cold slithered down my spine. I shook my head, even when I had, at least vaguely. Mom had talked about it a few times, and maybe Nina, but I was never interested enough to ask them to expand. The woman came to sit opposite me. Miss Atlas, can you confirm you're talking about Ben Maddox and Jessa Sharp? Her eyes darkened. Because Ben Maddox and Jessa Sharp have been dead for six years. What? I couldn't resist a startled laugh, but the officers weren't smiling. Before I could continue, the woman was pulling out her own phone with a sigh. On the 7th of October 2015, five students from Moorhead University tragically lost their lives when their bus drove off of a bridge. They looked for bodies, but apparently they were either swept out to sea or crushed on the rocks down below. She placed her phone in front of me. There was a photo of a news clipping showing a headline, but I didn't look at the headline. My gaze landed on a small, grainy picture of a group of college students, with Ben in the front smiling brightly, his arms around a girl who looked like she was mid-laugh, and a guy pulling a face. Their parents wanted no traces of the incident on the internet for privacy. The woman murmured, However, I kept this. She let out a sigh. Nineteen years old, with their whole lives ahead of them. One of them kids was my friend's little girl. Poppy, they called her. She was studying creative writing. Poor girl wanted to be an author. It felt... It felt like my reality was crumbling before my very eyes. That was what Ben had meant by drowning and being saved. They weren't dead. Whoever Ben's father was had taken them. No. I shook my head. My heart in my throat. I jumped up, slamming my hands down. No, I'm telling you. If you just go there, you'll understand. I spoke to Ben. He told me he nearly died. He told me he almost drowned. And someone saved him. Someone? The officer repeated. Yes, the store owner. The boss. If you're playing a prank, it's one hell of a sick one. The woman's son. Let those kids' souls rest in peace. And it became evident they weren't listening to me. I begged them. I begged them because all I could think about was Ben and Jessa and the others being trapped there. When the male officer finally caved, the two of them drove me to the Greensleigh Mall. When I was back in front of Forever 21, the police by my side, I was confident. An oldish looking man wearing a crinkled suit was standing outside, letting the shutters down. When he caught sight of us, his eyes narrowed before he pasted on a smile. Evening officers, he gestured to the shutters. I'm about to close up. He choked out a laugh. It's been one hell of a day. What can I do for you? I'm going to have to look inside. The male officer son. Like it. Pained him to say it. Young lady says your mannequins are actual people. Cleared his throat. Specifically, those of the Moorhead victims. The man's expression crumpled. Oh, wow. I'm not sure I understand. It'll only take a second. The male officer rolled his eyes. When the man pushed up the shutters, I rushed inside. First thing I noticed was Ben was gone. Jessa was still there, though a sweater had been thrown over her. Still, I ran over to her, shook the mannequin, uncaring how insane I looked. Jessa? I whispered before twisting around to face the officers. Do any of you have a phone? If you take a photo, they'll come back. Uh-huh. The female officer shook her head. She joined me and knocked on Jess's head. 
You're telling me this mannequin right here is 19-year-old Jessa Sharp? Yes. I was shaking. My blood was boiling. They didn't believe me. They didn't fucking believe me. Ben was here. He was right here and that guy. I pointed to the man. He did something to him. The man raised his arms with a scoff. Young lady, I have no idea what you're talking about. If you're talking about one of the male mannequins, I put him in the back for polishing. I don't have any kids, I promise. He was laughing. The bastard was laughing at me, and I looked out of my mind. Then bring him out, I said stiffly. If you use flash in front of their eyes, they'll snap out of it. That's enough. The female officer grabbed my arm. Ma'am, I don't know what game you're playing, but I should arrest you for wasting an officer's time. Her grip was tight on my arm when she dragged me from the store. You're a disturbed little girl who needs psychological help. She spat. Jesus Christ. The things you kids come up with these days to get attention. I was taken back to the station. And my mom was called. She didn't speak to me, keeping her head down. When we were leaving, and mom was muttering about parking spaces and how much they cost, we passed the same room I'd been in. I glimpsed the store owner and the male officer. The two of them were sitting together. 50,000, the officer murmured. I ain't going any lower. The store owner cackled. Brave, Tom. But you have yourself a deal. He rose to his feet with a sigh. I'll make sure to keep them in check. Mina? Mom was pulling on my hand and dragging me from the station before I could try and tell her. It's not like she'd believe me anyway. I tried to tell her. I've told her multiple times. It's like talking to a fucking brick wall. I went back to Forever 21 yesterday. Ben is in the window now. I feel like the store owner is laughing at me. Parading Ben in the window to show that he's triumphant. Well, fuck him. I'm getting Ben out of there. Do me a favor. If you're in Greensley, next to Forever 21, please look out for mannequins in the window. He's the one who looks almost lifelike. And if you look closer, it looks like he's crying. Summer Wave was a small store in my town that was a haven for anyone with $10. They sold the usual. Candy bars, soda, chips, and wine coolers. All reasonably priced. I would always go down there as a kid and use the allowance mom gave me to get chips and soda for an afternoon of gaming. The store itself was cozy and welcoming. Small rows of snacks with warm colored walls and young managers. Favorite vaporwave music playing on the radio. The manager Tiffany was a nice woman, who would often leave the counter to do something on her computer. It wasn't unusual to walk in and think the place was closed because no one was there. But ring the small bell at the counter, and she would come help you. I was an honest kid, and always rang the bell to pay, and I noticed there weren't any security cameras. It was all too easy for a robber to just walk in, slip a soda into his pocket, and get out scot-free. I asked Tiffany how she stops theft in her store, but she just shrugged and said, no one ever steals from here twice. I didn't see how she could possibly know. If someone stole from there twice, seeing as how she was always looking at her screen, but I do now. I walked to the store and saw police officers there. They were interviewing Tiffany. Apparently a mile up the road, someone had just ran his car off a cliff. Upon inspecting the wreckage, the police found his brakes were cut. Are you sure you didn't see anyone tampering with the vehicle sources say his last stop was here? The investigator asked. No, I didn't even really see him come in. The detective folded his book and shook her hand. Alright, miss. Ring us up for two sodas and we'll be on our way. As the police walked away, I asked her myself. 
Hey, so what was that about? She smiled, happy to see me. That? Oh, apparently someone was in my shop and I didn't know it. I thought I heard someone come in, but I didn't hear him or her ring the bell. I came to the fast conclusion that they might have stolen something to get out with such subterfuge. Well, I will take some donuts, please. She rang me up, and I was on my way. That was the first strange encounter I had with the local legend surrounding that place. A week later, I had made a new friend named David. He was a cool kid, other than being a troubled delinquent. We were going to the summer wave store when David noticed that there was nobody inside, and Tiffany was in the back helping her daughter with her homework. Bro, watch this. I watched as he snaked his way through the store and grabbed three cans of soda, two snack cakes, and chips. He had clearly done this before. Bro, look at that. Didn't pay a penny. You shouldn't do that. She's a nice lady. Yeah, she's also dumb as rocks. Let's go play Left 4 Dead. After getting home that night, I went to bed wondering if I should continue my friendship with David or find friends that didn't steal. I never realized that playing Xbox with him that night was one of the last nights I would have to spend with him. The next morning, I heard the news that David died in his sleep. A heart attack. His mom wept bitterly, and his dad didn't want to come out of the house. Soon it would be my turn to face the horror that brought his untimely end. It was a month later and I was at the end of my money. The heat was oppressive. I would give anything for a can of soda. August was not forgiving, and as I walked past Summer Wave, the heat made me crazy enough for an idea. I would sneak in while Tiffany was napping and steal two cans of soda. One for the day, and one for tomorrow, then as soon as I can, I would pay back Miss Tiffany as soon as possible. I crept in like a bandit hoping no one would see me as I was worried someone might walk in. But I was quick enough, I got two cherry sodas and ran out. Thought I would get off no consequence. I was wrong. That night, I went to bed with the fan blowing on me, and I was just about to fall into slumber when I noticed the fan go off, and a dark, malicious presence behind me. I was trapped in sleep paralysis facing the wall too terrified to turn around and see the thing lurking over me. Thief. I hear it say. Thieves aren't welcome in this neighborhood. I can move my mouth and speak loud enough to explain myself. Please, I had no money. It was so hot. I'll pay her back. It sounded like excuses coming out of my mouth. Lies. You're just like your friend. You stole from my store, my family, and my legacy. Why shouldn't I? Please, I pay every time. It was just this once. I think it sensed the honesty in me. Alright. I can tell you're not lying. You get one more chance, but steal so much as a candy bar, and it will be the last thing you do. I felt his grip on me release. I jumped out of bed and turned on the lights to nothing. I still shop there to this day, but I always make sure to ring the bell and pay. Because when I am in there, I can feel something watching me. No one seems to notice. Not my mom, not my dad, not my sister. No one but me. My brother Daniel was sitting in front of me, tapping the table with his right index finger. You wouldn't have noticed this, but my brother taps the table with his left index finger. He always does. It's been two weeks since my 13th birthday. It was the same day he announced he was going to leave for university soon, and the same day he started acting differently. It was little things most people wouldn't notice, but Daniel and I are close. We never left each other's sides. So I picked on it quickly. He was amazing at crash team racing. Not so much for me. He knew that so he would pretend to be bad and let me win a lot. But whenever I play with him now, it's like he's never touched a video game before. He pretends he's playing badly on purpose, but wasn't pretending. 
He loved pasta with cheese and chicken, but when my mom brought it out, he would seem just mildly happy. We rarely had it, and whenever we did, you would be able to see the excitement on his face. He was sleeping on his back quietly with the closet open. We slept in the same room for as long as I can remember. He used to sleep on his right side and snored like an animal every day. He always shut the closet open for me. I always saw something standing whenever I woke up in the middle. He never found anything in the closet, but I swore to him I always saw something. So he promised to shut it every night for me. But he stopped after my birthday. Something is wrong. This isn't my brother. I just know it. I'm planning to take it down, but I have to make sure this isn't my brother. I have an idea. I'll test him. I know Daniel will have no problem passing the test. He always loved going on adventures with me, so I invited him to come with me. He was busy on his computer, saying he's busy with his university application, but I insisted until he came with me. We went to an abandoned building not so far from my house. We came to this building years ago. We explored the rooms together. They were dusty, creepy, and unsettling, but I cared more about finding out if this person was my brother. We arrived at an empty small room with an infinitely symbol drawn with shock. Daniel drew it when we came here years ago. I was afraid Daniel would leave me. He told me he would be there for me forever as he drew it, saying his love for me equals infinity. I asked Daniel if he knew who drew it or knew what it was. He said he didn't know who drew it, and it means infinity. Now I'm sure. This isn't my brother. This person is an imposter. I have to take care of him. The night settled, and silence filled our house. Everyone was asleep. I was in the kitchen, sharpening the knife my mom always used. I watched my mom do it a lot. I wasn't good at it, but it was better to make sure that thing is dead. I stood next to my brother's bed as he slept quietly. I held the knife with a firm grip. I prayed to God, any God. He would snore and I would be wrong. I stood there for a second waiting for him, but all there was was silence. It was dark. I didn't know what happened. It's like my entire world became dark as I raised the knife. I couldn't see, hear, or feel. It's like I stopped existing. Moments later, I was on the ground. I heard screams of agony and pain. Daniel was... bleeding. Wait. No. He's supposed to be a monster. Why was he bleeding like a normal human? Why does his screams sound like his screams when he was hurt? My dad and mom barged in. Everything happened so fast. The next thing I knew I was being dragged by the police. Was I wrong? Did I just try to murder Daniel? Why? Why did I even think of doing this? My mind was flooded. I was filled with guilt. It's been three months since that incident. I was admitted to a mental facility. I haven't spoken a word after the incident. What I did never left my mind even for a second. My parents haven't visited me yet and Daniel would have left for university tomorrow if I didn't stab him. I was told I had a visitor. I was laying on my bed as I heard the door open. It was Daniel. He was wearing a medical eye patch. I couldn't even look in his direction, feeling the guilt killing me. He sat next to my bed as he started talking. I didn't want to hear his voice, but I couldn't stop listening. He was asking how I was doing, if the facility was nice, if I needed anything. I couldn't muster a response. I heard Daniel ask for a hug. I couldn't stop myself from breaking down and crying. I hugged him as he comforted me. I told him he acted differently. He didn't spend as much time as he used to. He even forgot the symbol he drew for me. I thought he was a monster or someone pretending to be him. I felt his hand rubbing on my back. You're not wrong, he said as I cried. Wait, what? 
I let go of the hug, slowly confused. I asked if he could repeat it. He did. He said I wasn't wrong. I'm not wrong? I must be imagining it. He grabbed my hand and handed me something. I couldn't move my eyes from it. It was an eye. Daniel's eye that I stabbed. It was cut in half. My hand started shaking as I looked up. Daniel was smiling ear to ear. Literally. His smile was so wide it was unhuman. His hand grabbed his face and pulled it upwards like a mask. What the fuck is that? That wasn't my brother. That wasn't even human. But it was wearing Daniel's skin. It sounded like Daniel, but it wasn't human. I know what the hell I was looking at. It was the thing I always saw in the closet. I screamed and cried as he let go of me. Nurses came in trying to calm me down as that thing got up to leave. He smiled as he waved goodbye. That thing isn't my brother. I always volunteered at retirement homes. Sure, it's maybe not the most fun way to spend a weekend, but it really helps people and maybe pads out a resume nicely too. As you may be able to imagine, not everybody there is happy, but this specific resident took her boredom and anger and channeled it into a most unsavory pastime. All right, ma'am, here's your water. The nurse practically screamed at the old woman next to me. The woman was hard of hearing, and the nurse was starting to lose it by the fifth. Pardon? Once she exited the room, the old woman next to me leaned over and, practically giddy with excitement, exclaimed that she was getting out of this dump next week. Her words, not mine. That's great. I half yelled at her. She nodded and grabbed a chessboard under the table we were seated at. She opened it up and made her first move. She moved the night. After a couple of turns, I started to ask her questions about her and her hobbies. The usual boring questions and the typical bland responses. About halfway through the game though, she asked me a question that caught me off guard. After I get out of this cramped place, would you like to come visit me at my house? Maybe have some tea? Naturally, this was an activity I would have preferred to avoid. I started to run down a list in my head of some excuses. Blanking? I asked. When? How about the 4th of next month? What time? 6? Shoot. I said. I'm busy then. The old woman started to get a little pouty. I don't know what came over me. Maybe it was the guilt of lying to this nice person. Perhaps it was the expression on her face, but... I agreed. The first thing I noticed was the gothic feel of the house. The structure was quite dated, and the unkempt grass and trees in the front yard were clear proof that it had been a while since someone had lived here. The house was also a little deserted. Thick trees covered the edges, and had the sun not been behind me, and not to the left or right, I would have had trouble finding a door. I walked up a decaying stone step, gripped the door knocker, and slammed it into the door. It took a while for the woman to answer. It was getting colder out by this time of night, not to mention we were well into fall. I was almost excited to walk into the house, despite the looming awkward small talk. She smiled at me and closed the door behind her, locking it using an old looking key. You never be too careful, she told me. I laughed clearly misreading what I thought was a joke. We lived in a nice neighborhood. She led me through the dusty, ancient front hall to what looked like a lounge room. The lights were barely on. I could make out the fine china all along the walls, however. She directed me towards a seat and I sat. She pulled out a bony finger, the universal sign for, wait one minute. She added on her way out the door, I'll get some tea. I hated tea. But I was not about to complain to her. While she was gone, I took in my surroundings. One word came to mind. Old. Very old. Before I summoned the courage to stand up and look around, 
She returned with two teacups, a kettle, and a tray. I have to say they were very nicely decorated and most likely cost her a fortune. She poured the tea and sat down. I politely took my cup and took a sip. And then another, and then another. It was actually pretty good. This was definitely not the tea I was used to drinking with my grandmother. Upon realizing how much I was drinking, the old woman smiled. And after wiping her mouth with a handkerchief, and she said she wanted to show me something. I took a quick sip from the cup and shot up to catch up with the surprisingly fast woman. She was out of sight before I got up the stairs. Hello? I yelled into the hallway. Her house was built like a maze and the dizziness I was feeling did not help. I blamed it on the cough medicine I took before I walked inside. I was allergic to cats and one look at the house's exterior told me it might be in for some puffy eyes. Then I noticed the messaging system on a nightstand. It was old, don't get me wrong, but it seemed a bit too new for a house like this. Then it blared. Hello? Madeline. I'm your nurse from Riverwood Retirement Home, and I'm looking where you are. It's been a while since you checked yourself out, and you're due for an appointment in an hour. Call me back. And the receiver clicked. I would have thought about why she lied about leaving the place. But then I heard the familiar voice of the old woman. She was making amends and promised to be there quickly. I would have listened if not for the dancing clock ahead of me. I was in a trance. The woman's words echoed in and out like a song, and the hallway started to dance around me. In and out, in and out. I couldn't help but dance along. Then I passed out. When I came to, the first thing I noticed was my heartbeat. It was swift. Then I saw the gag. Then the straps around my wrists. Then the chair. Panicked, I looked around again and this time noticed the room. White and light up, well compared to the house I was just in. It made my head hurt. My disheveled brain did not register the smell at first. The scent was eerily recognizable. It was the unmistakable smell of the house. I was still in the woman's home. Then my body started to catch up to the backlog of instructions from my brain. I began to scream. Not that it made much noise on account of the gag. I started to panic even more and more and more. Fortunately though, I was a logical person. After a little bit, I managed to formulate a plan. You see, the thing about nearly senile old ladies is that they are not very strong, nor do they know how to tie a knot. After exerting almost no energy, my thrashing arms easily bested the straps on my wrist. I removed the gag and walked to the door. The old woman was not expecting me to escape so quickly, so the door was not locked. I opened the door and walked out. I was in a familiar place, a lounge room. I guess the dimmers made it hard to see a door before. I did not have time to dwell on that though. I had to escape. I walked towards the front door and noticed the lock. She had not locked the door to keep someone out. She had locked the door to keep someone in. I panicked and tried to remember where she left the key. I was not happy to remember she had it on her person. I know that she was in an appointment on account of the voicemail left. I knew I had not been in the room long. I just had to wait for her to come back. I can easily overpower an old woman and take the key. So I decided to snoop around. The first thing on the agenda was how the hell she got me to faint. I knew she had spiked the tea with something. I was looking around for a bit to no avail. Then I heard the keys click. I hid in the lounge, waiting for the woman. She hummed some sort of tune as she made her way to the door I was supposedly in. When she rounded the corner, I jumped out and began to look for the key on her person. I found it almost immediately. Heart pounding, I started to bolt for the front door. I heard her yell for someone and subsequently heard footsteps pounding up the stairs. I was not going to find out who was coming up those stairs. I slammed the door down on this person's hand, guaranteeing me some time to make it to my bike 
escaping death and the terrible stench in her home. I still dwelled about that day. She was arrested, and the man who she was calling was also put away. It was all over our city's news. I still think about how close I had come to whatever fate she had in store for me. What if that man had tied me up instead? What if he had beaten me to the door? What if he was with her? I decided to take a walk to think things through when I saw a dreadful sight. A dead raccoon. Then I recognized the scent. The scent of death. This was the scent that still haunts me to this day. The smell I smelled in that house. I learned that day that I was just a lucky one. Back when I was a kid, growing up in rural Nebraska, I would go to my aunt's for a week during fall to hang out with my cousins and my other family. They'd take me to school about half an hour away each morning so I could still keep up with schoolwork. Those times that my cousins were usually pretty memorable, but one memory sticks out in particular. In 1993, when I was 15, I arrived at my aunt's house late in the afternoon. After my parents had said their goodbyes and left, my older cousin Scott took me over to his room and said, Whatever you do, Brian, don't look inside. If you hear something, don't acknowledge it. Don't search for it. Don't do anything. You understand me? I nodded my head hesitantly, because I was confused. He never acted like this before. So I was thinking it might have been a prank to try and scare me from going to the woods. At about eight... My aunt and uncle had left the house to go on a date night out in the city. So it was just me, Scott, and his younger sister, Valerie, at the house. At about 8.45, while Scott and I were playing video games, I thought I could hear Val outside. I asked Scott to pause the game so I could hear better, and I definitely heard her. Hey Scott, I think Val needs help outside. No, she doesn't. She's not outside. At this point, Scott turned off the TV, and I ran to go to the nearest room. I grabbed him by the arm and said, Scott, where do you think you're going? She's outside and she said she needed help. Scott then ripped his arm out of my grasp and whispered through his gritted teeth, I told you, she's not outside. She was never outside. She's been in the house the whole time. As I started to argue with him, Valerie came out of the bathroom. What's going on? What are you two fighting about? She was interrupted as her own voice screamed from outside. Scott, help me. Help me, Scott. We all froze as it continued. Tears began to well up in Scott's eyes and he whispered through trembled lips. I told you. I said then, a little shook up. Maybe it's just someone who sounds like Val. I'm going to look through the kitchen window to see what's going on. Scott began to shake his head from side to side, trying his hardest to convince me from going over there. But I didn't listen. Through the open window, the cries for help got louder and louder, and I peeked up over the counter to look outside. I saw what looked like a mountain lion or a wolf with its back to me, screaming for Scott. At this point, I was terrified, but I couldn't look away. Then it turned around on its hind legs and just stared into my eyes with what felt like burning orbs of hellfire. Then I noticed its face. It was grotesque and otherworldly, like some sort of eldritch horror. It then screamed, Brian, Brian, in my mother's voice. I ran towards Val and Scott and we booked it to Val's room where there were no windows and we didn't sleep the whole night. The next day, None of us had spoken about it, and we haven't spoken about it since. Some say love isn't looking at each other. It's looking in the same direction. But what if the person you love sees something that you can't? An impossible frightening thing. 
what happens to love then? I've tried telling my family, friends, and therapists what happened. It still doesn't make sense to me. So I just want to write it all out so that maybe I can see it clearly. Me and Logan met at university in London. I studied history. He studied literature. He was beautiful and smart. Smart, but also a moron. He would ruffle his curly, dark hair and say things like, If we're being Doradeen, Celia, there's no such thing as an author. And I'd try to push him into oncoming traffic. Logan and Celia, my first serious boyfriend. Our families were happy. His were originally Scottish and mine were originally Irish. So they joked that our children would be able to sing and bullshit beautifully. I was scared of how much I loved him, and how much I depended on him loving me. After we graduated, we stayed in London. I became a history teacher, and he started a PhD. With me on a teacher's salary and Logan on a stipend, we couldn't afford to rent anywhere fancy, but we had no idea how brutal the London rental market was. One estate agent offered us what you could generously describe as a cupboard. I had the idea that we could find somewhere rough and cheap and fix it up. Logan was weary about the commitment. He said he wanted to focus on his PhD. But then an estate agent told us about this place in Dulwich. Dulwich is a beautiful, leafy neighborhood with a large wood and an old-fashioned high street lined with bakeries cheesemongers, and bookshops. We liked books. We liked food. The estate agent there said they'd had a Victorian house on their system for months. A whole house, not just a flat. And the rent was half as much as the cupboard. It just needed some work. So, one balmy August evening, we walked hand in hand down a road of yellow brick Victorian homes. The estate agent waited in front of a gorgeous but neglected house. Huge bay windows, original tiling on the front path, a tiny Victorian letterbox. Inside was even better than I'd hoped. Sure, it was full of dust and rubbish and the wallpaper was peeling off. But it had three bedrooms, a living room, a large kitchen, a huge bathroom, a garden, and a cellar. My eyes narrowed. You know that phrase, there's no such thing as a free lunch? Well, in London, if you work in a state school and your boyfriend is a student, there's no such thing as a nice flat. I said to the estate agent, I'm falling in love with this place. Please tell us the catch. He laughed. The landlord doesn't want to spend any money. When you get in touch, I said to him, I rented to this young couple for a year or two. Let them improve it for you. Then you can sell it to some higher value clients. He laughed again. So the catch was just, well, capitalism. At least we'd have somewhere nice to live until the landlord wanted to upgrade his tenants. And I'm pretty good at DIY. I could tell 80% of what needed doing was just cosmetic. The original flooring was still there, underneath the gray carpets. The walls needed to be stripped and painted. Someone had hoarded up all the original fireplaces, really intensely, like they were at war with Santa Claus, which I'd restore on day one. Then there was the cellar. It was unusable. It had large, earthier clothes, about waist height, which stretched off into the dark. It was dank and dark and full of rubbish, and it smelt bad. I thought, okay, so we just shut off the cellar, but we still have lots of room. We said yes. We walked away hand in hand through our new neighborhood, under a peach puree sunset. It was the last time we were uncomplicitedly happy. Those first days smelt like dust. It was like we were disturbing dirt that had been there for 150 years. To begin with, we were helped by friends and family, but soon they went back to their lives and me and Logan were left with the piles of ripped up carpet and wood. One late September day, which turned to be the last day of summer, 
We lay a picnic blanket on the freshly mowed lawn and had a supper from the local bakery. Rusty baguette, blue cheese, pate, and a bottle of wine. We felt good about the house for a while, but then Logan took the plates inside to wash up and he tripped over a pile of paint cans I'd left out. As we cleaned up all the paint, he got annoyed. He said he was going to put all the decorating crap in the cellar out of the way. I went back outside, lay on the blanket, and watched an old, tall oak gently knocking against the house. I tortured myself. He hates all this work, and it's all my fault for dragging him into it. I heard him turn the key to the cellar. I heard him going down and up the stairs with the paint cans. The space between going down and coming up became wider. Then he went down. And there was nothing. Twenty minutes passed. I got worried. I went to the top of the basement steps. I could only see a neat stack of paint cans. I couldn't see around the corner to the rest of the basement. I called down to him, and he came around the corner and up the stairs so quickly that I jumped. It was like he'd been caught doing something, and he acted kind of irritated with me. Or, I thought he did. In bed that night, I wanted to have sex, but he didn't. That's fine, obviously, but usually he'll just yawn and tell me that he's tired. Instead, when I snuggled into his neck, he just snapped, no. I froze, shocked. He tried to laugh it off. I slept badly. I knew he couldn't be angry at me because I'd left some paint cans out. I started to worry something was wrong with our relationship. Maybe we'd moved in together too soon. Just the usual relationship paranoia. I wish he'd tell me what he was thinking. Autumn arrived, and the school term started. I was really busy. So was Logan, who worked on his PhD at home. We caught up every evening during dinner in our slightly echoing living room. The home improvements had slowed down, but the living room was nice enough. With a scuffed wooden table, even bookshelves and a flickering candle stuffed into an empty wine bottle. But with each dinner, he seemed more exhausted and ate as if he'd spent a day running a marathon rather than reading English literature. And during one dinner in October, something seemed to snap into him and he went on a kind of rant. He said he'd been reading the book of Ezekiel from the Old Testament. I asked if it was for his PhD. He snapped and said there were more important things than his PhD. He seemed frustrated. I thought back to the night with the paint cans, and all my insecurities crept out again. He went on, talking as if he'd prepared his remarks carefully. He said there was a quote from Ezekiel he'd been thinking about a lot recently. He got up and walked over to the bookshelf and took out our copy of the King James Bible. Ezekiel. Logan's son, was a faithful priest famous for his visions. He inveighed against the faithless who had turned their backs on God. In Book 8, God shows him just how faithless Jerusalem had become by showing Ezekiel a vision of the temple. The treacherous priests were worshipping idols, but not just any idols, the worst kind of idol. The Lord brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw, and there, every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel, portrayed all around on the walls. And there stood before them seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel, and in their midst stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. After Logan read it aloud, he looked at me carefully, waiting for my reaction, like it was a test. I was anxious, but I tried to crack a joke. Bad idea. Priests. 
Don't piss off Yahweh. After a moment, he laughed. But before he laughed, he looked scared. Over the next couple of weeks, Logan got busier and more tired. But his PhD reading stayed on the bookshelf. Instead, he read books on a crazy cluster of topics. The Sumerian goddess Utu. The Native American deity Hopi. The Egyptian goddess Neith and West African folklore. And there were books on the Amazon rainforest, local Dulwich history, and Victorian zoology. I hoped he'd had a breakthrough in his PhD, and that this was why he was reading such strange material, and why he was so tired and distracted. I chose to see things that way, and I chose not to think about why more than once. I came home from school to hear him running up the cellar steps and locking the door behind him. Logan started to put on weight. I'd see empty tubs of ice cream in the recycling. Whole tubs that he must have eaten while I was out. He ate large helpings at dinner. A couple of times. I gently asked if there was anything bothering him. Because I knew he overate when he was depressed. He assured me he was okay. I'm fattening up, he said with a smile. It was a strange thing to say, but he didn't seem depressed. The date he first really scared me was November 15th, my birthday. Logan must have seen a stone heavier than when we'd moved in. He was tired all the time, but wired with a manic energy. I dropped hints that I wanted to go to my favorite Italian restaurant for my birthday dinner, but he said he wanted to cook for me at home. I was a little disappointed. We barely left the house together anymore. He served up huge portions of an Italian feast. He was usually a great cook, but everything was too sweet or buttery. It was like he was trying to get as many calories into each spoonful as possible. He brought out a huge birthday cake with candles and ate almost a quarter of it himself. I ate a mouthful and drank coffee and listened to him rant about a new topic that was obsessing him. He told me he had researched the first occupant of the house. He'd been an eminent zoologist, who in 1880 had traveled to all the jungles in northern Brazil. And do you know what lives in that part of the world? He asked, excited. I shrugged. This wasn't how I wanted to spend my birthday. Goliath spiders, he said. And then he laughed, as though this was a punchline. He carried on. The zoologist discovered something amazing in that jungle. He came back with it in a big wooden crate, but he never told anyone what it was. Came back with what? A Goliath spider? Much more than that. Well, I've never heard of this guy. Just because you haven't heard of it doesn't mean it's not important. He snapped. I snapped back. We had an argument. He apologized. That night, I lay in bed hoping that the argument was just what we needed. The tension of fixing up the house had boiled over, but maybe now things could be normal again. Maybe we would have makeup sex. I was very sexually frustrated. I never cheated on Logan, but I admit I had started to notice other men, on the tube or in a bar with my friends, and I fantasized about being with them. I wanted Logan to come to bed and for us to make things more normal again. I lay there for an hour. Then I went to find him and heard him down in the cellar. The door was ajar. He was whispering, Let me serve you. Let me serve you. Let me serve you. Let me feed you. I was so frightened that I didn't know what to do. I was scared to interrupt him. I went back to bed and I lay down and waited in the dark, my back to the bedroom door, staring at the wall. I thought I heard the front door and Logan slipping out, but I can't have, because a moment later I heard the bedroom door creak open. I pretended to be asleep. He barely made a sound. I felt the weight of him slumping down on the other side of the bed, and I suddenly felt a wave of fear and disgust. It felt like there was a huge, hairy, creepy thing behind me, poised over me. I wanted to scream and run out of the room, but I felt pinned down. I just lay there, eyes screwed shut, heart racing. 
After a very long time, I must have passed out. The next morning, his side of the bed was empty and he was in the living room, reading his strange books again. He looked like he hadn't slept. Reading over all this now, there are two words screaming off the page. Mental illness. Logan was on well. Maybe avoiding thinking about that was starting to unhinge me too. He needed professional help, but it was too much to acknowledge at the time. So instead, I decided the problem must be with us, as a couple. I chose to think Logan was up to something as prosaic and sad as having an affair. I had a vision of a burner phone, hidden in the cellar, filled with messages to some other woman. And when Logan started locking the cellar door and hiding the key, it seemed to confirm my paranoia. One night, Logan had a stag do for his best friend. He didn't want to go, but I encouraged him. He was anxious about what I'd do in the house on my own. I lied and said I would go to the cinema with a friend. The moment he left, I went to the hallway. I had spied him hiding the key to the cellar under a certain book. One of the ones with a cover of something crawling and horrible. I unlocked the cellar door and went downstairs. I hadn't been down there since we'd moved in. The paint buckets were still stacked at the bottom of the stairs. I rounded the corner and was met with that foul smell again. But it was much worse now, like rotting meat. I gagged and had to cover my nose. It was the kind of smell that you seemed to taste, even when you covered your nose. The light didn't work, but Logan had left an empty wine bottle with a candle in it. I thought, what the hell is he doing down here that he needs a candle for? I lit the candle. The floor was covered in scrunched up pieces of newspaper and rubbish. I worried that if something was rotting down here, there might be rats or some other kind of infestation. I raised the makeshift candlestick tentatively to see around the room and looked up at the wooden beams. I nearly dropped the candle. I let out a short cry which made me smell the air again. So I gagged and nearly threw up. I looked back up at the beams. They were covered in scratch marks. Not from fingernails. The markings were deliberate. I think he'd done them with a screwdriver and a hammer. Knocking the shapes into the wood. The image depicted over and over again was of a creature, drawn like a hieroglyph, with four legs pointed up and four down and eight eyes staring out. It was often drawn next to a man, as though for scale, to show it was the same size. He'd drawn it hundreds of times. I ran back upstairs. No, that's not right. It's strange. I struggled to remember this next part. I didn't run upstairs. Not straight away. Something caught my eye in the deep, dark, earthly a clove that stretched back as deep as the house. I held the candle up and looked into the dark. It was the weirdest experience. I felt an instinctive, primordial fear. Like if you saw a tiger readying to pounce right at you. Fangs bared. Eyes glinting. Your body just reacts to something like that. But I saw nothing. Heard nothing. In fact, it was like my eyes failed to focus. Were forced to move around anywhere but right in front of me. Anywhere but a patch of space just a few feet in front of me and about the size of a person. Yet my body was screaming at me to run. I listened to my body. Once upstairs... The memory of the nothingness in the dark faded quickly, but the image of Logan's hideous shrine did not. I rang my best friend Kathy. I failed to explain myself very well, but she understood enough through my blubbering to insist I go to her place immediately. An hour later, I sat with her, drinking wine. I told her everything, apart from my non-experience of looking into the dark of the alcove, which had slipped from my memory. She had to pull the truth out of me because I felt like, by voicing my worries, I was making them more real, giving them harder edges. 
and she made me confront the obvious truth that Logan was having a mental breakdown and needed help. She asked me if he had hurt me. I told her he hadn't, and I added that I wasn't frightened of Logan. I was frightened for him. It was only as I said that that I realized that was exactly how I felt. It was easier to think at Kathy's place. It was like my house was drenched in a brain fog, but now I could see things clearly. Logan needed psychiatric help. Our relationship was going to be affected, perhaps very seriously, but the priority had to be to help him. Kathy made me stay at hers that night. I texted Logan and told him I was having a girl sleep over at Kathy's. He texted to send his love to her and said he would miss me. Then I felt bad. Was I overreacting? The next morning I went to work and when I got home, I asked Logan to come out to the garden with me, even though it was a cold December evening. I turned our outdoor lights on, poured us both a drink, tried to behave normally because I didn't want Logan to think this was a breakup conversation. The plan was to be supportive, to tell him about the therapist I'd researched in my lunch break, that I was worried about him and that I loved him and that we'd get through this together. But before I could say anything, he sipped his wine with pleasure and turned to me. You know, I've been weird lately, and obviously you've noticed. I nodded. I wanted to say I'm sorry. I've just been really worried about the PhD. I thought I was going to fail. I got kind of hung up on some ideas that I thought might get the juices going again. I even... I know this is crazy. I had this idea for an angle about ancient mythology. This will sound weird, but I tried practicing rituals from different religions. Praying to ancient gods to please let me finish my PhD. You know? He laughed. But actually, having the place to myself last night, I finally just sat down and sorted myself out. I started reading my actual research again. I burst into tears and hugged him. I told him that I had been worried. I thought something was really wrong. I admonished him for not communicating with me. He laughed with relief. I could physically feel the worry leaving me every time I kissed him on the lips, which I did a lot. It felt like I'd been given a diagnosis of a terminal illness, only to be told there'd been a mistake and I'd be okay. We'd be okay. He glanced up for a moment, into the shadows of the old oak tree that touched the house. I followed his gaze up to the dark triangle of branches and again felt that strange sense that my eyes couldn't focus on something. It was like one of those trick images where if your eyes focus just right, you see something. Except my eyes couldn't focus. But I didn't feel fear. I felt relief and happiness. And soon there was something else to focus on. We kissed more. I suddenly felt very, very eager for us to go into the bedroom. And I could tell he very much felt the same way. We spent the rest of that night in bed. For the next month, things were nearly back to normal again. Logan wasn't exhausted anymore. It was like he had performed some great task that had been hanging over him. Now he could relax. We had sex regularly. We cooked elaborate meals. I noticed that I was gaining weight too, but I felt okay about it. It felt natural. It was natural because I was pregnant. When I told Logan, I was overwhelmed with how happy he was. I thought about how we'd always planned to have kids, about how Logan would be such a great father, about how our families joked that the Irish and Scottish heritage our children would sing and bullshit beautifully. Maybe you're thinking, what a stupid woman. After all that, she got pregnant. Well, it wasn't as simple as that. If you'd lived through it all, You'd have seen all the small moments of normality, of love, of day-to-day -day living. Yes, there had been a scary few weeks with Logan, but that seemed over. Really, it did. And against all that was my love for him, and my terrifying dependence on that love. 
I saw that and nothing else. We decided to keep the child. We'd figure out the finances. We'd ask our parents for help. We'd find a way. Logan was so happy. It was like Christmas Day for him every day. He took great pleasure in feeding me, serving my every craving. He joked that he was fattening me up. One day, about four weeks before the due date, I went in for my final day of work before maternity leave. Before I left, he came to the front door and looked at me with tears in his eyes. I thought they were tears of happiness. I really, truly love you and always will. We're doing something bigger than ourselves now. Have a great day at work. I hugged him and went to work. I felt warm inside all day long. They never found Logan. The last four weeks have been the worst of my life. I can't describe the despair of holding your stretched stomach in your hands, feeling those tiny kicks in an empty bed that still smells of the love of your life. The police officially called him a missing person because they never found his body. They searched the house. They searched everywhere. But his suicide note, however mad it was, told the whole story. I've debated whether to write it out. It's very painful to me. But that's what this has been about. Writing out the pain and looking it in the eye. His suicide note was addressed to me. He wrote about how the moment we moved in, he had felt tired and agitated and drawn to the cellar as if by a voice. Then he got to the night he took the paint cans downstairs. There he was, as I'd seen him in my dreams when he called out to me. I saw something at first because he did not want me to see him. Then I saw the eight glinting orbs of light. I was scared, but he calmed me. He told me that we would be friends, that he had been alone for a long while and that he wanted a new friend. Then I heard your voice, my love. I ran upstairs because I didn't know what you would think of him. I tried to research him, but I began to understand the limits of books, which I've relied on my whole life. Instead, I spoke to him. In the night, I went down and whispered to him because he slept during the day. He commanded me to feed him and I did. I brought him meat and he would appear and I would watch him tear it apart. I asked him how he disappeared. He said my human mind could not comprehend it, but that his eight legs allowed him to scuttle between places, even in my mind. I asked him if there were others like him and he said yes, that there were others. The humans wrote of us in their old books. And I remembered that passage from Ezekiel and tried in my own way to tell you. He commanded me to fatten up. I didn't dare ask what for, but I hoped I might prove myself useful to my master somehow. I told him I had read that the man who first owned the house had gone to the jungle in Brazil. I asked, was this where he found you? And my master hissed and his mandibles clicked. He said no human could find him unless he wanted to be found. He had drawn the man to him. My master said he was an arrogant man, and he thought I would be his pet, not the other way around. Ever since I have dwelt here, a new human comes every so often, often enough for me. My master said he knew there was another human in the house, a female. He told me that he had sensed you through the floorboards. One night he sent me out for food and he said he crept from his shadows and up the stairs and crawled up onto the bed next to you and lay there, breathing in your fear. He told me your fear was sweet, but there was one thing that would make it sweeter, something that would allow me to serve him better than any of the humans who came before. I begged him to tell me. He told me that you had seen the shrine I had made to him and that I should tell a lie about it. He told me I should make you happy. He told me that my ultimate task was to put a youngling in your belly. That night, do you remember? We sat in the cold with our wine and I made you happy. I lied and said I was only distracted with work, and I saw my master up in the oak tree among the branches. He told me I had done well. 
Now put the youngling inside her. And we did just as he told me. He said he would wait for us. He said first he would call me, and then he would call you. He would call you and make you come to him with the young one still inside you. Call us for what? I asked. To show you, he said. To show us what? I asked, hardly able to contain my excitement. He raised his front legs and his palps quivered. You will have to wait and see. Now he tells me it is time for me, my love. I love you so much. Remember that. And he will help us complete our love. I know I will see you very soon. I love you always. Logan. I don't know what stage of grief I'm in. So much has happened to me and the baby is coming soon. I feel overwhelmed. Writing this out has been helpful, but it's been painful too. Sitting here at the dining table where we used to chat at the end of every day. I just feel there's one thing I still need to do. One place I still need to go. Just to see. I don't know what dark feels like. Sure, the word's in the dictionary, which means I know the bloody definition. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that I've never had the absence of light touch my skin, so to speak. Some of the others have, and that's all top of the morning, but after having it explained to you hundreds of different times in the most confusing ways possible, you'd think that people wouldn't be able to make a simple concept like darkness so unbearably frustrating to understand. You just kind of let it go and move on with the way of things. For a while, anyway. Because it always snakes back, doesn't it? That one cursed thing that eludes your understanding no matter how hard you try to wrap your thinking around it and grasp its complete meaning. It's like one of those puzzles the geezers throw at us as we toddlers. Something so damn confusing that it makes you want to yank out every strand of blossoming hair but still maddeningly intriguing enough to convince you to come back to it the next day after, despite all your bubbling stress. That's dark for me. There used to be a blind girl who lived among us, and one day I asked her about him. Surely she'd be able to divulge the true meaning of darkness. After all, that was her reality. But to my surprise, she couldn't. I'm serious. She said that since she had no clue what light was, she couldn't possibly begin to explain what dark would mean to someone like me. A person with as much sight as the giant bulbs above us were hot. But I pressed her. I wanted some kind of answer from someone who couldn't see a lick of a thing every hour of the day. And when she gave it, I was struck dumb. I swear to you. This is what she said and I'll never forget it. I guess, to you, darkness would be absolutely nothing. I thought about that one for weeks, let me tell you, and eventually, after I'd turned the idea over hundreds of times in my head, I went back to her for more. I couldn't create nothing in my imagination. I knew that there was more to life than always being under the lights. I'd read about creation and all that, but if there was always something, then what was nothing? Was it a scientific property found in the center of a star, maybe? Could nothing be created? I wanted more answers. She had to know more. She just had to. But she'd never tell me. Not because she wouldn't, but because she couldn't. She was gone by the time I went back to her. Taken away, a stranger told me. She'd done something terrible and had to answer for her crime. I wondered what crime a blind girl could possibly commit, to which the stranger shrugged and said he had no perfect clue. He simply told me to forget about it, and while I was at it, her too. I wouldn't see her again, he said. No one would. Not after being taken away. You can imagine how much that burned me, but I've seen others dragged off. Some of them dear friends... And the stranger was right. I've yet to see any of their faces again. 
It's just a part of life under the lights that you accept. But I still wanted answers. I was still juggling 50 pound balls of curiosity and yearned for someone to ease my mind, so I tossed my question his way. What do you think nothing is? I asked. Nothing? He gave me a sideways look. Like one would give someone diseased. Yeah, nothing. Like the absence of everything? The stranger looked up at the unwavering lights, stroked his shaved chin, then shook his head. You kids ask the dumbest bloody questions, I swear to Christ. But if you really want to know so bad, I suppose I'll tell you. He pointed up. You see all those lights? I nodded, following his straight finger with my eyes. Yeah. Well, nothing's what we'd be if they all went out. I threw a rock down the well. It clattered against the walls as it bounced from one side to another. I waited, straining both ears. No indication that it had reached the bottom. Hello? I whispered tentatively in a low, shaky voice as I peered down into the darkness, my eyes unable to penetrate its inky depth. My voice was reverberating against the sodden, ancient walls, lessened to a discordant choir of echoes that was harassing the stillness of the enclosed darkness within. Something felt off. I was not supposed to be there. It had taken up most of the evening for me to gather up my courage to make my way across the barren land alone before entering the heathenberry forest. Jamie Colden's words had been echoing in my mind all the way to the clearing. If something answers you, just make sure you don't tell it your name. He had warned me the day before as we walked across the edge of the forest adjacent to an old dilapidated train tunnel due north. Why not? I asked him. What will answer me? He had been staring at the reddening summer sky, his pale blue eyes sparkling with mischief and amusement. You ask too many questions, Marcus Wellington. Stupid questions. Just don't fucking do it, alright? Not too many people know where to find that stinking old well. They go there to be told if they are going to be successful or not in their lives. You toss a dime over for each question. Make it quick. Never ask questions whose answer you don't want to know. Most importantly, never tell it your name, or it will steal your soul away. I had gasped and cringed at him because I had never heard any kid my age use that kind of harsh language before. But Jamie had always been one to act cool and older than his actual age for attention. Besides, he was much older than I was. You're kidding, right, Jamie? The only reason why I am here telling to you now is because I feel sorry for you. Your father was a good man. Helped my family a lot. I'm not doing this for you, Cretan. Kathy and I will leave for the city next week. Don't tell anybody I told you that. We've got everything figured out already. Her friend has a place for us somewhere. We're getting married as soon as we leave this stinking village. We're not coming back. Her father will skin me alive if he ever sees me again after running away with his only daughter. His pale round face had been contorted into a mixture of determination, hope, but also anguish as he continued. If you are smart, you get out of this place as soon as you can before you lose your mind as well. These people are hopeless. Or go to that well. Whatever. If that makes you happy, I don't care. Wait until the clock strikes midnight. Make sure nobody follows you or knows where you're going. You have to do it alone, or else it won't answer you. You see that hill over there? He points to the west at a dark, bluish hill looming over the plain in the distance. There was a small trail on top of it. Follow it. It will lead you due south into the forest. As the brush grows thicker, that you can barely smash through it. You'll arrive at a small clearing in the middle of the forest where you can weave easily through the trees. That's where the well is. Don't follow the trail west beyond the clearing. There's marshes. 
People have drowned and died trying to make their way across the godforsaken plain. And he had been right. The air had been chilly when I emerged from the tree line. I had found myself walking at a small, roughly circular clearing which was devoid of anything taller than knee-high dandelions. And there in the middle of the mini savanna, almost hidden in the darkness from probing eyes, I had seen a small dilapidated stone mound, its structure black and sunken. Hello? I called out again louder, but still as hesitant. My whole face tensed hard. This time, a dreadful silence was filling up the well. There were no echoes, as if the well had just swallowed my voice whole. Confused, I bent down to pick another rock off the ground. Hello? A voice suddenly rose. I gasped in horror and cringed away, only to trip over my own feet. I fell backward and landed hard on my buttocks. As I sat there in the cold, hard ground and waited, feeling convinced the devil himself was going to rear up from his subterranean tomb to get me, something flashed across my mind. A cautionary tale Jamie had told me earlier today before he left for the apple farm, where he had been working for a few years. You dare to summon it. You have to finish your business there. Never forget to say thank you and goodbye when you're done. Otherwise, it would think you're not done and follow you around, watching you in the shadows everywhere you go. I struggled to rise to my feet and stood gazing intensely at the derelict stone mound, frowning at the ancient-looking symbols etched into its rough surface. My chest was heaving rapidly with fear and uncertainty. That voice had aroused something in me that I had never known I had. This primal fear of the unknown, of what awaited beyond the darkness. Hello? It chirped. Hello? It drawled with a contemptuous voice that suggested disguised danger. It sounded warm but also distant at the same time. There was an unnervingly familiar tone to it, I realized. It almost sounded like my own voice, only distorted, much deeper and feline like. Don't be afraid. Come closer. It hissed almost inaudibly. What? What are you? I stammered. Well, I'm a wood fairy. It let out a gleeful chuckle, an image of tiny winged human with pointed ears and delicate features drafted through my head instantly, which did not match the malicious voice from below. Really? Yes. It hissed loudly, as if blowing air through gritted teeth. You see those symbols? They are called Ogam Inscriptions, an ancient magic spell to keep me here. I can neither hurt nor touch you, even if I wanted to. I need your help. Will you help me? I was afraid of engaging myself more with this disembodied being. But I knew it was the only way for me. Nothing else would work. What is it? It's... Uh, it's my father. I started to sob. My shoulders shook vigorously as I rested my face down on the cold, rugged stone surface, feeling hopeless and defeated. And very soon I was overwhelmed with a sense of indignation and outrage again. I was not paying attention to my surroundings. The forest around me had fallen silent. The trees and the wind had seized all of a sudden, as if the whole land was holding its breath in anticipation. What is it? It asked again, colder and more demanding. I lifted my face off the stone and stared into the darkness below, feeling slightly confused. As I narrowed my eyes to concentrate on trying to catch a glimpse of the slightest movement, I felt like the forest was closing in on me, disintegrating into shadowy walls that were pushing me incrementally from all directions towards the inky depth to answer to the call of the void. Hello? I leaned over the mound and arched my body to peer down. Tell me, what is it? What? Uh, 
What would you like me to do? I opened my mouth but could not find the words to say. I retreated thinking maybe it was not a good idea. Maybe I should just go home immediately and never return to this cursed forest. You can tell me. What is it you want? I can help you. It said coyly. Can you bring him back to me? The words had escaped my lips before I could even stop myself. There were a few seconds of silence that almost made me turn on my heels and take off, not wanting to hear any more of what it had to say. It felt so wrong talking to something you could not see because it was hiding in the dark, the embodiment of darkness itself. I toyed with the idea of what was real and what was not, but even then, I knew that I was trespassing the border of reality. Of course, it said. Really? I asked. Would you believe me if I told you that your father was down here with me, looking up at you, and all you had to do was jump over to be with him? I, I don't think that's a good idea. I took a step away from the well, rubbing my face. For one, I knew exactly where my father was, six feet under the ground at Rocco Cherry Cemetery, a few miles down west from the outskirts of town where we had him interred a few weeks before, not in the bottom of an old, dilapidated well. The concept of death was something I was still struggling to get a grasp on. For all I knew, he could be somewhere else as well, waiting. I was only a kid and there was only a hint of skepticism flashing across my thoughts as I considered its words. Will I survive the fall when I can't even see the bottom? Is it telling me the truth? A cold, high-pitched laugh rose from below, devoid of any emotion. It sounded hollow and insecure. You're one smart kid. So, can you really? I hesitated. Yes, I will bring your father back to you. Will it make you happy to see him again? Surely it will. What? What's the catch then? I asked him cautiously. What do you want from me? Very bold of you to assume I want anything at all from you. Then what? What is your name, dear? I opened my mouth to answer, but then Jamie's words the day before flashed across my mind again. I'm not allowed to tell you my name. Why? Now that's a lie. Who told you that? My friend. Well, what do we know about this little friend of yours? Isn't he a huge and slow as a grazing bovine on a summer day? Everyone knows the rules. We can't tell you our names. Well, everyone doesn't want to bring their father back from the dead now, do they? But you do. You've been missing him a lot, haven't you? It's killing you. This is a very huge favor you ask of me. Besides, I only want to be your friend. Aren't friends supposed to know one another's name? Or at least we can stay on a last name basis if that's more convenient for you. Isn't there any other way then? Oh yeah, there is. What is it? Please tell me. I need human sacrifice. Blood. What? Did you just say blood? Human blood? Burst into a mirthless laugh that sounded unpleasant and cold. Wouldn't it be much easier if you just told me your name, my dear boy? Then I decided it would be worth it to just go with it. All I had to do was tell it my name and my father would return to me. It wasn't rocket science. I opened my mouth, but whatever instinct had kept me from doing so for the last 20 minutes or so suddenly caught up to me again. Yes, friend. Your name. Tell me your name. It said reassuringly. And you and your dear father will be reunited. That's all it takes. It took a power of will to break my silence, but between heavy breaths and gritted teeth, I finally relented. It was the right thing to do. That night, I stumbled onto the truth about Heathenberry Forest as it spoke to me of things beyond my comprehension. 
Catherine Dean Shaw's eyes were puffy and red when I saw her the following day in the village. She seemed troubled and unhinged. She was looking in my direction for the briefest moment in such a way as if wanting to ask me something, which under different circumstances, if only things had been different, I would have been more than happy to tend to. She had always been a nice girl. She waved at me and smiled confusedly, and walked away with John Clearwater, the son of the richest man in the village with whom her father had always longed for her to be involved. It pained me to not be able to help her, genuinely dead. But I needed to disengage myself from any responsibility that was not my own. I had been looking forward to subsequently seeing things fall into place. My father's return. It was the only thing that mattered to me. I was only 14, after all. There was a house at the end of our street. Its walls were cracked. Its lawn was overgrown with weeds. The shutters were always drawn. The door never opened. This was our street. Our house where the monster lived. There were four of us. We were kids but on the cusp of becoming that mysterious thing. Teenagers. I was the runt of the litter. I wore glasses and clothes that did not quite fit because they were all hand-me-downs. The others did not speak to me much, and when they did, it was usually to badmouth me. Jake, the eldest, called me Shadow because every time he looked around, I was there. I was secretly delighted with this nickname. For one week that summer, it rained nonstop. Stuck in the house on my own, I drew a whole series of cartoons with a superhero called the Shadow. His costume fitted him perfectly, and he had 20-20 vision. Then the hot, dry days returned. I can't tell you what day of the week it was when we gathered under the cover of an old tree. Going back to school was still forever away, and there was nothing we could not do. So we were going to do our favorite thing, mount an expedition to the house at the end of the street, and try and spot the monster. Jake had seen the monster three times. Andy, once. Jane, never. I had told the others I had seen it, but this was made up. The monster, for those in the know, was a hideously deformed shape which drifted past the windows and could be glimpsed. If you screwed your eyes up just right, through gaps in the rotted wood of the shutters. It was over seven feet tall and trailed drool from its mouth. It was bald, so bald in fact that in places, even its skin had fallen away leaving exposed bone. It never washed, and it went to the toilet wherever it pleased. This list went on, but save to say, it was a beast and by far the most thrilling thing, not just on our street, but in our entire hometown. Probably the entire state, according to Andy. Preparations for an expedition were meticulous. Jake had a baseball bat in case the monster tried to attack us. Andy had a compass in case a cloud covered the sun and we could not use it to navigate. I had bread and cheese that I had snuck from the fridge at home, stashed in my trouser pockets. Jane, on this particular day, had a serious attitude problem. She wanted to go watch the fair being set up in the town square. We suspected there were older boy motives involved here, but said nothing. So, as armed as we could be, we left our hiding place under the tree and set off towards the house. The sun was so hot, our skin was stinging within minutes. Sweat trailed down our backs. We crept past whitewashed fences guarded by shrining post boxes. Dodged water spray coming from sprinklers. Pulled faces at a barking poodle imprisoned behind a window. Our destination was close now. We crouched behind a low wall and whispered how we would take in turns to stand up straight and stroll past the house, real casual-like. Only we would be doing our best to see inside, to chalk up a sighting of the monster. Jake went first and should have won Mr. Nonchalant 1975 the way he moved. 
Once he was safely on the other side of the house, he paused and drew an imaginary line in the air with his finger. The universal symbol for one more confirmed a sighting of the monster. And he was next. Showing A-plus bravado, he slowed right down as he passed the windows and tried to peer in. From a distance, of course. It was obvious from the slump of his shoulders that he had no joy from this time. Jane should have been next. With me last in line, as always, but she was showing no interest. I wanted to prod her in the back to hurry her up, but prodding was touching. Touching a girl was not something I had ever done. I muttered instead, Hurry up, slowpoke. Jane pulled a face and said, I'm not playing this stupid game anymore. I replied, It's not a game. The monster is real. Prove it then. Give me the proof that the monster is real and I will. Let you kiss me. Now that was a curveball. Having said what she said, Jane finally strolled past the house. She paid it no interest. My heart was beating ten to the dozen and my skin was burning, which was nothing to do with the sun. Then I managed to remember where I was and what I was meant to be doing. I made my sweep of the house, but I was a million miles away. That evening back at home I could not sit still, and I was not sure I was ever going to sleep again. I needed to act. Arming myself with a torch and the camera that had been my combined Christmas and birthday present, I crept out of the house. I left the radio on in my room to ensure my parents thought I was where I should be. By the time I had silently negotiated the front gate, I was considering a career as a spy when I left school. Superhero, obviously being a pipe dream. My code name would be Shadow. I would have to think what the letters stood for later because at that point, I needed to focus. I had a four point plan. Get in the house, take a photograph of the monster, show photograph to Jane, kiss Jane. At that moment in time, the monster was not the most terrifying thing on the list. I drew in deep breaths. I had reached the house at the end of our street. It was still in darkness, which of course it would be. Monsters love the dark best of all. It was now that I began to see the gaps in my plan. For a start, how on earth was I going to get into the house? I decided to head around the back of the house and see if any opportunities presented themselves. After scrambling gracefully over the fence, I skirted the side of the house and came out into a backyard so overgrown with weeds I had to wade through them to reach the back door. I could see no other possible way in, so gave the door a gentle push. It would be locked, and then I would go home and watch TV and forget about this whole thing. That felt very appealing. The door swung open at my touch. Damn. I stepped inside. The darkness deepened. I was met by a sickly sweet smell. The air felt clogged with dust, and I spat to try and clear my throat. Then I heard a buzzing sound, and things brushed against my skin. What the hell? I clicked my torch on. A scream formed inside me. There was a thing sitting in an armchair in the middle of the room. The torchlight had caught it right in the face. Its eyes seemed to be moving, and then I realized that it was flies. There were dozens of them. Hundreds. They were everywhere. On my face as well. In my hair. Even in my mouth. Sputtering, I tried to swat them away. The thing just sat there. It wore a vest and braces and dark trousers. All were filthy and torn. The skin of its face was drained of any color. It had been a man once. Realizing this, I finally screamed. Two yellow eyes looked up at me. A rat was sitting in the man's lap, and I had disturbed it. It seemed to consider me for a moment and then return to what it had been doing. I saw a tug at a gray, stringy thing through a hole in the man's guts. I screamed again and again. One of the neighbors must have phoned the police. Ours was a quiet neighborhood, and I would have interrupted quite a few families watching their soap operas. The next thing I knew, there were sirens, and police were shouting into the house. The light from their torches made mine look like what it was. A child's toy. 
There's not much more to tell. I was grounded for a long time after that, until well into the new school year. Not that I felt much like venturing out. Jake and Andy came around one afternoon and wanted to know exactly what had happened. They were clearly disappointed that I had not got a photograph. I did not get to kiss Jane either. As for the poor man in the armchair, I did not ever find out who he was. A lonely person with no family, I guess. There may be monsters out in the world somewhere, but there never had been one on our streets.